covered trade-related labor and environmental issues since 2007. Uh, since 1999, he has worked very closely with C4, the Center for International Forestry Research, and also has consulted for various development agencies, including CARE and International Research Group. Uh, he received his MA and PhD from Yale, where his training focused on governance institutions and trade related to sustainable development. Um, one last uh, piece of info before we get started, which is, as I alluded to earlier, we are webcasting this event. So. When we get to the Q&A and the discussion, just hang on a second until we can get a microphone around to you and let us know who you are. So I'll stop talking uh, and turn things over to Henrik. Thank you very much, Gib. Um, um, first of all, I, I would like to thank you and, uh, and Jeff for uh, inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure coming here. It's very stimulating and, uh, and indeed uh, rewarding. So, um, so thanks for that. Uh, and and uh, I'm very glad to be joined by, by Steve Ree, uh, who knows a lot about things that I don't know anything about. And uh, I look very much forward to his presentation. Uh, and I'm sure it's, uh, it will be, uh, hopefully it will be uh, uh, complimentary and interesting. Um, to, I, I thought I'd start out by this. This may be very familiar to to many of you. Um, start out by by saying a little bit about sort of the general um, schools um, addressing the the relationships between population pressure, resource scarcity, uh, and violent conflict. Uh, and there are essentially three schools. Uh, the, the the most sort of um, well um, established school, if you like, is, is uh, sort of the, the resource scarcity uh, school uh, represented by Thomas Omer Dixon uh, and Colin Carl. Uh, they've done a lot of, of, uh, of very detailed uh, case studies over the past 15, 20 years um, uh, and uh, generally finding uh, some relationship between resource scarcity uh, and conflict. Uh, then you have the Technological Optimism School, uh, represented by people like uh, Esther Bulsarup and, and uh, Julian Simon, uh, sort of an economist rational choice uh, school, focusing more on how population pressure can be uh, sort of driving development rather than uh, conflict. Uh, and finally, you have the Political Ecology School, uh, which uh, is um, focusing more on local level factors and primarily on distribution of resources rather than uh, population pressure uh, as such, even though I would argue that there are some meeting points um, between the Resource Scarcity School and the Political Ecology School that tend to be uh, at least um, under-communicated. Uh, Palouse and Watts are some of the, uh, of the most uh, sort of prominent researchers in that tradition. Uh, a, a very simplistic uh, display of the uh, resource scarcity model uh, advanced by Homer Dixon and others. Um, so Homer Dixon argues that there are essentially three sources of resource scarcity. Uh, it's population pressure, uh, which represents um, the demand for resources. Uh, then you have resource depletion, um, uh, so reducing the supply of resources. And finally, the issue of distribution. Uh, of resources, and he argues that these three sources interact to create um, cases of resource scarcity in, in different ways. I'm not going to go into details on that. Um, resource scarcity, uh, again, has uh, externalities um, uh, related to economic stagnation, uh, migration, uh, both uh, within rural areas uh, and uh, rural to urban migration, uh, urbanization. Um, and uh, this leads to resource competition uh, and potentially to armed conflict under uh, specific conditions. Um, if we want to sort of put up the technological optimism model of, uh, of um, uh, say, uh, Julian Simon, uh, it follows basically it, it, it follows the, the first two steps, uh, arguing that it, it may very well be that population pressure and resource depletion. Um, leads to resource scarcity, um, but Simon sees this as um, a vehicle uh, that drives technological innovation, and, and Esther Bolsonaro actually argues that, that one of the reasons for, uh, for um, 
under development in uh, some parts of the world, uh, most notably in, in sub-Saharan Africa, is the low population densities uh, and the availability of land rather than uh, so scarcity being the driver. Uh, and technological innovation uh, leads to economic development uh, and eventually to more peace rather than more conflict. Um, there has uh, been a, a quite, uh, quite substantial, as I said, quite substantial um, uh, case study uh, program um, led by Thomas Homer Dixon and other programs as well, a uh, Swiss program uh, by Ginter Bechler. Um, and uh, there have been a, a number of very detailed case studies coming out of these programs and other uh, programs as well. Um, what um, this has meant, it, it, it has been very important for the development of the field. Uh, and, uh, but I, but the, the conclusion uh, out of some of these projects uh, went perhaps a, a bit further than, uh, than at least sort of in, in, the, in the popular uh, versions uh, of the results. Um, uh, went further than, than, than uh, uh, perhaps warranted. And, uh, I've been involved in, in, in some of the critique of uh, the case study literature. Uh, my um, supervisor and leader of the environmental research group at PRIO, uh, Nils Petr has been one of the champions of, 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 sort of environmental security and has been um, criticizing uh, some of this work based on a number of different um, factors. Uh, first, there is a problem much of this, much of, in many of these programs, is that there is a selection on the deep end variable, meaning that uh, the case studies that have been picked uh, are cases where there is violence. Uh, and so the case studies have tried to verify that there is, there is a relationship one way or another between uh, population pressure, resource scarcity, and violence. And if you look well enough, it's always possible to find some connection. Um, Second, many of the, the, the models that are presented are, in, in our view at least, uh, unnecessarily complex uh, and makes it difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, study in a more systematic uh, or generalistic uh, way. Uh, there has been a uh, tendency in some of the literature to use future as evidence, and particularly uh, the issue of climate change has been raised as, as a potential uh, sort of, of, of issue, um, and, and, and the argument has been that, well, if, if there is no connection now, uh, there will be as things are getting worse, and, and things are often getting worse, in, 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 at least in some of these uh, uh, pieces. Um, there is also an unclear, or at least a wide conflict definition, uh, so measuring anything from very high intensity civil wars or even interstate wars down to uh, inter-ethnic, low-intensity uh, local violence. Um, and also, um, there has been a very broad definition of resource scarcity employed in many of these um, studies. Finally, um, I think that most case study uh, scholars acknowledge this, and, and it's, it, it really shouldn't be uh, that much of an issue, uh, but clearly, one of the limitations about the case study uh, case studies is that it's very difficult to uh, to to establish causal relationships ba based on on, on 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 case studies. Um, on the other hand, there, there are a lot of things that you can critique um, uh, quantitative studies for. This has been my approach primarily. I've I've been uh, raised doing uh, sort of cross national uh, quantitative studies, uh, so. I'm in for some uh, some critique here as well, um, and primarily, I think that that one of the important uh, critiques from the case study literature um, is that national level studies do not capture local dynamics very well. Obviously, we we look at national measures of population uh, growth and density, uh, national measures of resource scarcity, uh, and and sort of national measures of violence, and and correlate these and. Uh, if, if we don't find anything, that tells us something, but it doesn't really tell us very much about local dynamics. Uh, also, many dimensions that we know are of interest to the issue are not testable in these kinds of models due to data limitations. Um, it could also very well be argued that we have a very narrow understanding of violent conflict. We typically look at 
armed conflict, conventional armed conflict between organized groups. There are a whole lot of other f types of political violence that are of interest uh, in, in, in this respect, in my view. Um, so um, there, there, there are now a fair amount of, of quantitative uh, studies on the country level um, that suggest that there is very little, if any, relationship on the country level between measures of population pressure, resource scarcity, and uh, conventional conflict. Uh, and Haugen Ellingsen, which was sort of the only one standing out, has now been uh, very, um, it was one of the early studies, and, uh, uh, and it has now been, been uh, They've been trying to replicate the study, even with the help of the authors. They're not able to replicate the findings, and, and which basically leads to the conclusion that country-level studies do not find a very strong relationship between population pressure, resource scarcity, and conflict. Uh, and this leads us to to ask whether you know, are how can we reconcile these findings between the case studies and the country-level studies? Uh, <clears throat> And uh, there are basically two, <clears throat> two important directions that the, 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 this research is going in now, and that is disaggregating studies, looking at the subnational level, at the local level, um, and also looking at other forms of violence. And particularly, uh, there is a huge data collection effort now on what we call non-state conflict, which is conflicts where the state is not directly involved. So between ethnic groups, between um, sort of uh, different uh, regional group, regionally based groups. Um, and that could be, there are many reasons to expect that that could be sort of a more interesting aspect of uh, sort of the, the population scarcity conflict relationship. <clears throat> so uh, going to disaggregated uh, studies. Um, in, in the way that I use them, I, I use, um, you, you could think of it as a quantitative case studies where you look at one, one area, one, particularly one country, um, and, and try to see systematically, to, 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 uh, to, to study systematically uh, what explains uh, the patterns of violence within countries. Um, and looking at within state variation in violence, um, means that you, to some extent, control for a lot of state-level factors, like democracy uh, shouldn't have any impact on the internal, uh, or at least sort of regime type isn't something that distinguishes between um, uh, violence within uh, a country. Um, it should also, the, the, the usefulness of, of, of uh, these kinds of studies is that they capture local dynamics to a better extent. Uh, and also that because we're looking at one country, uh, there's, all, there's, there's typically greater availability of data on the types of items that we want to look at. Uh, and also that the data are consistently collected uh, and that categories are the same over time, even though there are, um, you know, th there are problems with data collection and and categorization of data uh, within countries, uh, these problems are just so much uh, more uh, significant when you try to do cross-national studies. Uh, and then um, what I'm going to say a little bit more about is uh, the, the case studies or the, the quantitative studies, the disaggregated studies that I've done on, on India and Indonesia. Um, first, um, the India study. Um, what I did uh, for the India study was that I looked at uh, 27 um, states within India uh, of different sizes, but um, sort of having approximately the same level of, of autonomy and, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, regional uh, governance structures. For, for those with, with a particular interest, we're, I'm, I'm excluding the uh, union territories. Um, and um, India is, I'm looking at the 1956 to 2002 period and looking at three different measures of violence. Uh, India is an incredibly uh, interesting case uh, for a subnational study due to the very significant um, variance in demographic environmental factors and also uh, the very significant uh, levels of, uh, of violence in many parts of India. India actually, um, 
last year or in 2007, which is the most recent armed conflict data that we have, uh, India was actually home to five of the 34 active conflicts in the world. Uh, and um, these are primarily, it's, it's primarily the northeastern uh, area of India that's home to most of the sort of conventional conflicts. Uh, and uh, in 2007, there were active conflicts in um, Nagaland, Assam, and Manipur. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was still uh, a conflict going on in Yamu Kashmir uh, in the very north. Uh, and then finally, the fifth conflict is a conflict uh, between uh, popularly called uh, the, the Naxalite movement uh, or the, the, the Communist Party of India, um, which is sort of the, the where mo most of the next light groups uh, belong. Uh, and, and that conflict is, is confined to the areas around, uh, or started out in, in West Bengal, um, and then it's primarily now active in, in, in Chhattisgarh uh, and, uh, and Bihar. Um, but there are a lot of, of group, different groups, uh, different places, and it goes down to, to Andhra Pradesh as well. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm using a measure, uh, or I have a violent political events measure, which which measures very broadly different types of, of violence. Uh, and then finally, a specific uh, data set on Hindu Muslim rights collected by Ashtosh Varshne and Stephen Wilkinson, um, looking at uh, specific events um, occurring uh, in relation to uh, to Hindu Muslim violence. Uh, and and uh, the most affected areas uh, are uh, sort of a belt stretching from Gujarat uh, in the west uh, through Maharashtra, um, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, and uh, Chhattisgarh. No, sorry, uh, Bihar as well. And Yarkand. So as you can see, India, the, the, the patterns of violence uh, in India the, varies depending on what kind of, uh, of, uh, of violence you're looking at. <clears throat> um, so what I did for this article was that I did a quantitative studies where uh, I looked at the state level within India uh, and looked at different factors um, associated with population pressure uh, measured primarily as rural population growth. Uh, resource scarcity measured as land scarcity, that's uh, per capita availability of rural land, uh, and also the agricultural yield, which differs quite significantly between uh, the Indian states. Uh, and also measures of uh, distribution uh, using a rural inequality measure. This is what we call vertical inequality or the Gini uh, inequality measure, uh, but in rural areas specifically. Um, and also uh, looking at uh, what Thomas Dixon uh, calls uh, social effects uh, measured as uh, the change in agricultural wages uh, and also urban population growth as uh, rural population pressure is assumed to create rural urban migration. Uh, in addition to these primary uh, factors, I'm also looking at, uh, so this is a multivariate model, I also look at other factors like uh, GDP per capita, uh, um, and um, uh, the size of the state uh, and, and uh, conflict history. Uh, the general results uh, from the study uh, is that I find support for some of the uh, uh, expectations, uh, starting from a, a resource scarcity perspective. Uh, rural population growth and rural population density uh, seems to be uh, increasing the risk of uh, violence. Uh, and also the decline in agricultural wages uh, increases, are associated with uh, an increase in, in violence. Uh, and also there are interaction effects in particular between rural population growth and density and um, density and um, low agricultural yield. But there are also some very important aspects of the theory that's not supported uh, in the Indian case, uh, in particular uh, urban population growth seems to be negatively associated with violence. So in the states where you have very high urban growth rates, there is a lower level of violence. And that's also the case uh, for, uh, if you look at riots, which is a, a primarily a sort of urban phenomenon, uh, 
there is a negative relationship between uh, urban population growth and the risk of rights. <clears throat> Uh, there is no support for the inequality connection uh, in the India case. Uh, and also, as I said, then uh, rights is not only uh, unrelated to urbanization, but also generally to population and resource factors. Turning to the, the Indonesian case, <clears throat> uh, so we, the, the setup is, is, is similar. Um, this is a study that I did together with three colleagues, including uh, Sulfan Tajedin, who uh, collected the conflict data that we're using for the uh, UNICEF uh, IR in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, we're looking at 25 provinces, uh, provinces out of the 32 provinces for this period, 1990 to 2003, and distinguishing between uh, what uh, is, is defined as more routine violence. That's it's collective violence, but uh, uh, more types of, of neighborhood brawls and 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 um, popular justice kind of, of violence, uh, while uh, episodic violence is typically inter-ethnic uh, violence. And uh, for this study, we're using um, we're looking at uh, population pressure and land scarcity on one side and ethnic polarization and horizontal inequality on the other side. Uh, and horizontal inequality is here defined as um, not inequality between uh, individuals, uh, uh, as, as we measure by vertical inequality measures like the Gini coefficient, but systematic differences on the group level. Uh, and here we measure horizontal inequality as inequality between different religious groups, the, the two largest religious groups within uh, each uh, region. <clears throat> and we will look at how these factors uh, interact as well. Um, this is just to give you an idea about uh, the, uh, the pattern of violence uh, in Indonesia uh, at, as measured by the, the two measures that we use. So you can see that uh, routine violence is, is, is more uh, happenly, uh, happening more frequently in uh, regions in, uh, in Java. Uh, and there are also um, quite significant levels of uh, violence in uh, South Sulawesi and, and in Sumatra. Um, this measure is, um, is the number of years in the period that we're studying that have seen uh, violence or routine violence uh, with at least five uh, people killed um, uh, and so it's measuring the number of years uh, that, that sort of passes this, uh, past this threshold. If we look at uh, accumulated episodic violence, uh, you, we can see that the pattern is quite different. So Aceh, uh, uh, in the west uh, of, uh, or the, the north uh, west of, uh, of uh, Sumatra, uh, um, has uh, several years of, of episodic violence. Uh, you also find uh, Western Kalimantan, uh, South Central Sulawesi, and um, uh, Maluku and Papua uh, with very high levels of, of episodic violence. Um, again, the model uh, is, is similar to the one that I used for India. Um, we're looking at um, interactions of uh, resource uh, supply, uh, demand, and distribution, um, and uh, the population and resource factors that we're looking at is population growth. Uh, we also use the measure of migration that, that uh, we didn't have uh, sufficiently good data on migration to really uh, go forward with that, but we, we, with the data we had, we didn't find any significant relationships uh, between migration and conflict. But I think that with, with uh, more sophisticated data, uh, it would be interesting to look at that again. Uh, and also uh, land scarcity measured as uh, availability of potentially arable land. And then the identity factors that we used uh, were polarization measured as um, uh, the relationship between the largest uh, religious groups within uh, each region, uh, and also horizontal inequality. Uh, horizontal inequality is, is, is measured based on um, demographic and health surveys that provide information both on the individual level when it comes to uh, religion uh, and also 
different um, um, household goods uh, that we use in, in education and infant mortality that we use to construct different measures of horizontal inequality. Uh, and finally, we also use measures of vertical inequality based on the same uh, model, uh, on the same data. Uh, and what we find in this study is uh, what we believe is, um, okay, I'll, I'll start with, uh, generally we find that population growth uh, does seem to affect the level of routine violence, although there is a fairly weak relationship. Uh, what is perhaps more interesting and we think is the first time uh, has been shown on in a quantitative study is that relationship, interrelationship between population growth and horizontal inequality. So in, in regions where you have very high levels of population growth, whether that's due to high sort of natural growth rates or migration, uh, combining that with high levels of inequality between religious groups, there seems to be uh, an increased risk of, uh, of violence. And that's, that's routine violence, not uh, episodic violence, which surprises us a little bit because we, we think that that's, that's a relationship that's particularly uh, important for sort of inter-ethnic violence uh, rather than uh, non-ethnic violence. On the other hand, uh, again, there are some, some aspects that are not supported. Land scarcity does not relate to uh, either type of violence uh, and is also uh, negatively associated with, uh, with uh, episodic violence, in, in, in negatively and, and statistically significant. Uh, and also, um, there is no association between, there is no uh, interaction effect between population growth and land scarcity uh, affecting violence. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's also, uh, if you look at inequalities uh, outside the interaction effect with population growth, there is no effect of inequalities on levels of uh, either uh, type of uh, violence. And finally, no uh, uh, effect of religious uh, polarization uh, on conflict. So to, trying to wrap up, uh, some of the general conclusions from sort of the more broad um, cross-national studies and uh, these um, sub-national studies. I've also done um, a separate study where we look at, we, we parse the world into small uh, GIS cells and look at local relationships and we basically find the same, uh, the same thing as, as, as in, the, in the Indonesia studies that there seems to be some, something more in local relationships uh, than in the cross-national uh, studies. Um, and while the cross-national studies yield little support for uh, the resource uh, scarcity perspective, uh, generally uh, several of the sub-national studies uh, uh, find uh, an effect of uh, resource scarcity. And some of the tentative explanations uh, for this uh, uh, could be that um, there is, even, even though there, there, there's no sort of a general lack of, of or sort of general uh, issues of land scarcity and population pressure, uh, there could be sort of local issues related to the lack of attention by central governments or even restrictions on movement of people. Uh, it could also be sought, uh, sort of, or, or potential uh, solutions uh, could be found in, in, in providing local governments or regional governments with greater capacity uh, and, and making them more responsive to uh, local needs. Uh, and finally, uh, it can of course be argued that, that there is also low uh, adaptive capacity among people in order to address uh, sort of issues of, of scarcity and, uh, and, uh, and pressure on uh, resources. Um, so I think I'll end uh, on that note. Thanks. Just go right here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Switch. Oh, yes. Go and switch seats. Yeah. yeah it'll be easier. Yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, Heinrich for that uh, great presentation. I was just, you know, sort of thinking, um, kind of being a kind of a geeky academic, like, you know, what do you get when you put a demographer and anthropologist together? You get a Woodrow Wilson event, evidently. So. <laughs> Um, I, uh, and I want to thank uh, Gibb and the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here and providing me the opportunity to present uh, some previous research that I did.
Um, let's see. Is this the? It's the point. Oh, okay. Is it here? We go. Uh, slideshow. What is? How do I do this one? This one? Oh, for, okay. From the beginning. We just converted to uh, the new Microsoft Office over where I work. So, um, <laughs> anyhow, um, so this presentation is based on uh, field work uh, that I conducted in Indonesia from 1999. Uh, through 2004. Um, it was part of my research for my master's and PhD degrees at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And this is sort of a small case study. The broader uh, research actually looked at the nexus between research policy and practice in the uh, aid community uh, in the forestry sector. Um, and the presentation focuses on uh, collaborative research I conducted with the Center for International Forestry Research. Um, and it'll be a case study of the district of uh, Malanao in East Kalimantan. So you can see, uh, sort of, I've squared off Malanao out there, and I'll have a couple more maps. But it's in the northern, eastern part of Kalimantan. So the whole island is Borneo, and it's split between uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the city state of Brunei. Uh, but uh, the Kalimantan portion is the part that belongs to the Indonesian nation state. Um, and um, just to be clear, uh, I'm, I'm presenting my previous research here, and I'm here today as a AAAS fellow, so I'm not here speaking on behalf or representing uh, the government, which is where I'm a, I'm a AAAS fellow at the State Department. Um, and also, uh, the purpose of my presenting uh, this research is really to think about sort of uh, uh, prospectively, because with climate change and the link between climate change and forests, Indonesia is very much on the map again. Okay, so uh, speaking of force and Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is sort of characterized by sort of a narrative of forest reform, but really a reality of uh, deforestation. So Indonesia's forest loss continues uh, more or less unabated, uh, despite global concern for the resource and uh, forest-dependent people, as well as wealth of knowledge about the problems and solutions, uh, poor governance, corruption, perverse incentives in the industrial sector. And here we have, what we have is um, sort of a depiction of uh, degradation of lowland forests in, in the island of Borneo from 1950 to about 2005 and then possibly 2020. Um, and uh, a lot of Indonesia, as many of you know, is marked by a history of uh, resource extraction uh, by strongly centralized government under uh, President Suharto. And uh, a few of the benefits uh, of that resource extraction uh, were actually uh, provided uh, to those people living in around uh, the forest area. And uh, as far as the number of people who uh, depend on forest resources, uh, approximately 40 million uh, Indonesians, about a fifth of the population, depend directly on forest resources for their livelihoods. Um, and governments uh, and international donors realize the importance of the forest resources uh, for the subsistence needs um, of the significant percentage of the population. Um, and Indonesia, of course, as you know, is uh, considered a country of mega diversity. So all four big uh, conservation organizations are there. Uh, you have 10% of the world's remaining forests, 25% uh, of all the fish species, on and on. Um, and sort of in response to this uh, perceived crisis, uh, Indonesia has received a fair amount of uh, international assistance in the forestry sector. So from 1997 to 2003, uh, just bilateral, multilateral aid was around $300 million, uh, and that was focused on the forestry sector. And at that time, it was the EU, Japan, and the UK who were the biggest bilateral donors. Um, and this doesn't include funding to, for C4 or for uh, any of the big conservation NGOs. Uh, but I want to put this in context because if we look at donor funding in the, in the broader context of the trade in, uh, in wood products in Indonesia, it's actually a very small amount. So uh, in 2001, uh, wood-based exports accounted for more than $4 billion of revenue. So if you compare that to... Uh, 60 million a year. It's actually quite small. Um, and it's uh, wood-based exports are the third largest non-oil and gas export uh, after textiles and electronics. And um, as I mentioned before, the descriptions and the, uh, the problems in the forestry sector are the same sort of now as they were 10 or 15 years ago. Um, not much has changed. 
uh, many of the stakeholders, uh, they rarely use research findings. Their incentives not to. Um, and the rate of deforestation continues. So over a 10-year period, the sort of equivalent of the land mass of the UK is, has been degraded. And now I wanted to uh, put sorry, the, um, the district of Malinau in the context of Indonesia. Um, so I don't know if you can see the contours, but just I'll just point it out. Here's the district. So uh, generally speaking, again, about Indonesia, about two-thirds of the country is considered forest to state under the authority of the Ministry of Forestry. But it's actually uh, the vast majority of it has never been gazetted. So that, 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 uh, that's equivalent of 120 million hectares. And for Kalimantan alone, that's 90 percent of the island, of, of, of the Indonesian portion of the island. And that means all the people living in that area are legally squatters, and many of them have been there for generations. Um, and as I mentioned, they've received very little compensation for any of the extraction that's happened there, whether it be timber, gold, uh, or other minerals. Um, and uh, one of the, and so this is created uh, even before, even during the Suharto regime, a fair amount of conflict. And there's a very different sense uh, of conflict than what Heinrich was mentioning. I mean, at times, it would become violent, like in 97, 98, between the Dayaks and the Madaris in central Kalimantan. But in many ways, it's a sort of low-level, constant um, hum of, uh, of tension and unease, um, which is the way I'm sort of thinking about, about conflict here. And uh, a lot of times the conflicts are between uh, local villagers, uh, the indigenous people of Borneo known as uh, Dayaks, and that's sort of a, a broad category, sort of like our Native Americans. So within that you have uh, a lot of different uh, tribes. And the uh, Dayaks are traditionally Swidden rice cultivator, cultivators, so dry rice cultivation in the uplands. And they're primarily Christian now, um, although they were previously animist. Um, and so one of the, from the, from the environmental and conservation community, one of the ways uh, to sort of uh, resolve these conflicts between local villagers and government and extraction companies has been through participatory mapping of uh, traditional uh, territories. Um, and this was a way, it was often it was seen as a way to sort of legitimize the rights of, uh, of, of Dayak villagers who actually had no recourse otherwise. Um, and it was a way to, for them to negotiate rights and compensation. And so C4, the Center for International Forestry Research, uh, initiated a participa participatory mapping activity uh, for the boundaries of 27 villages uh, in the Malanao watershed. Um, and this was at the request of villagers. So we'll sort of uh, zoom down into Malanao. So this is now the, the district of Malanao, and it's, it's actually huge. Uh, it's 42,000 uh, kilometers, or about the size of the Netherlands. 95% um, of it is classified as state forest land, even though uh, a lot of it uh, doesn't have forest. Um, it's, again, it's never been gazetted. The total population of the whole district is only about 40,000 people, 20 of which live in the district capital in the river town of Malanao, which is sort of in the upper right-hand corner of the, of the circle there. And then the uh, population within the district uh, self-identifies into 20 different ethnic groups, uh, primarily uh, Dayak. And uh, by Indonesian uh, government standards, more than 50 percent of the population is considered uh, poor in terms of housing, clothing, and uh, daily meals. So we'll do, zoom down a little further to this watershed where C4 worked on the uh, participatory mapping activity. Whoops, that's wrong, zoom. Okay, so here's a Malinau watershed. Um, and this was a map that uh, C4 produced. And I just throw this up here just to show you the sort of uh, the complexity of uh, the ethnic makeup. So this watershed, uh, which if you go, as you go south, you actually go uphill uh, uh, into the farther reach of the watershed. It's about 500,000 hectares. It consists of 27 villages, not that many people in total, 6,500, but it's split up into 11 uh, Dayak ethnic groups. And then within that, you have sub-ethnic groups. And so they self-identify into the subgroups as well. And villages can be the size of 15 people to 1,000. 
and settlement in the watershed has ranged from 18, the 1850s to 1960s. So I was just thinking about this in the context of uh, Heinrich's uh, presentation as well, like how do you, you know, sort of bring all of these kind of disparate sources of information together. Um, and just uh, a word about, um, about uh, Dayak villagers who live in this area. Um, as I mentioned, uh, they're heavily dependent on the natural resources. Uh, they do dry rice cultivation, so they'll open up secondary or primary forests uh, for dry rice cultivation. Um, also uh, use the forest for non-timber forest products like rattan. And then rivers, of course, uh, primary mode of transportation and also cleaning. And, but people also work for uh, you know, timber mining companies. They work for the government. Uh, the family that I live with, they actually own a photocopy shop. Uh, and the electricity is uh, generated by uh, diesel generators. Um, but farming and, and the forest still remain uh, a safety net for them. Um, and uh, as we know, extraction companies also very much uh, depend on the natural resources in the region. So this is just a couple of photos of the types of activities that go on in this region, uh, which is logging and uh, open strip coal mining. And uh, the main reason I throw this up here is just to kind of demonstrate the kind of boom, boom and bust cycle of a lot of these economic activities. So you started uh, with logging in this area in the 70s, uh, died down for a little while. Suharto consolidated uh, large uh, timber companies and then was active again sort of in the 80s. The mining company opened up in the mid-90s, was active for a year, died down, and then it came back. And it's, it's just someone has the, the concessionaire lease. And... Uh, and they just subcontract out. So uh, the, the boundary conflicts, uh, actually, um, I'm not sure how many of us are familiar with sort of the process of decentralization, but essentially with the fall of Suharto in 98, uh, there was, uh, and then you had a centralized government, there was a rapid move toward a decentralized or a federal sort of government. But instead of uh, decentralizing to the equivalent, equivalent of our states, they actually decentralized to, I guess, the equivalent of counties. Um, and that was in part because uh, certain parts of the central government were, were concerned about certain provinces or states seceding, you know, natural resource rich ones. So you had this process of decentralization in 1999. So as, as the country moves towards this process of decentralization, C4 works with these 27 villages um, to uh, to negotiate boundaries between villages and also between villages and companies that were operating. Um, and, uh, but there are several, oh, and this is a picture of, this is actually preceding decentralization. This is a, a signpost for uh, uh, demarcating the boundary of two villages. Now, there's a, what would happen in this dispute is that someone would then come by and knock down the signpost and then someone will put up another one later. So you had a very weak sort of uh, institutional uh, framework there. And that sort of continued to be the case. And I, I'm not sure uh, how many of, uh, of us are familiar with the sort of participatory mapping process, so I just wanted to run through the basics of this. So it was facilitated by C4 and Indonesian NGOs over a four-year period, uh, covered the 27 villages, and essentially the way it worked was that you had three village representatives from each village uh, selected by the village. They were trained in uh, GPS technologies, and C4 worked with them uh, to produce uh, maps. And I actually have a, uh, this isn't one of the C4 maps, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the maps look like. This is from another project, actually. Just... So the, the, the map that I distributed is indicative of the, the ones that C4 produced, which is essentially overlaying uh, on a topographical map, um, uh, or the uh, forest concession, and then also uh, negotiated village boundaries. Um, okay, so then you uh, were getting uh, to more of a heightened conflict. So um, with decentralization, uh, as the mapping was taking place, a sort of ad hoc decentralization process was taking place. Um, the implementation regulations for decentralization weren't clear at all. And so one consequence of this is uh, district government started issuing uh, small-scale timber permits. And then all of a sudden the institutional landscape uh, changed dramatically. 
because uh, previous to this, the district governments were just rubber stamps. They received nothing. And everything, uh, all the uh, licenses came from the central government and all the royalties went to the central government. And the central government then cut a piece of that pie, a very small piece, and give it back to the district government. So this was their first time. In Indonesia, we call it Jaman Balas Dendam. You know, it's the era of uh, revenge because this is finally when the uh, natural resource rich regions could actually accrue some of the benefits. And so uh, what you had over sort of a, a year long period was, hold on a second. Oh, okay. So right, from uh, 2000 to 2001, you had 46 licenses. Uh, provided to concessionaires, small scale concessions from 100 to 5,000 hectares. So in total opening up at about 60,000 hectares. Now for these concessionaires to, to, to be granted licenses by the district government, they actually had to have the agreement of the village claiming that forest, neighboring forest. And villages in the watershed had produced maps like the one that's going around uh, with C4 and they used that as a legitimizing tool. Um, but, you know, there was no cross-checking with the, by the district government at all. You know, the district government was just looking for the documentation so they could issue the license. And it'll be a little clearer uh, why that was in a second. And so the maps were produced, uh, the maps produced in the participatory mapping were used to leverage the position of so primarily certain village elite at the expense of others. Um, and the duration of the licenses lasted from a few months to a couple of years. Um, and, and this is a, a, a sense of sort of who benefited and how. So uh, in the best case, a village was able to negotiate about $6 per cubic. And this is, six, this is six more dollars than they would have ever gotten. And in the worst case, it wasn't negotiated at all. And the village just went on the promise of, of something. Uh, but for some villages, uh, they gained a lot, an uh, average of $1,000 per household per year. And this is compared to the pre-decentralization era, $1,500 per village per year. So this is uh, dramatically different. But at the same time, it's all sort of relative because if you look at what the price of this timber was in the river town of Malanao, the villages were only getting about 1.4% of the, the gross uh, value of, of the first timber trade. And uh, 19 of the 22 villages uh, reported concessionaires uh, didn't fulfill promises ran out on, on, on them without paying. And then you had also the uh, extra informal payments to uh, village elite um, up to, and then within the district government, uh, timber brokers uh, mentioning paying up to $7,500 for individual district uh, government signatures on the licenses. Um, so a little bit more about the sort of unintended consequences. This actually, this period of decentralization and this uh, ability of district governments to issue timber permits and to make the forest and uh, land surrounding the area much more valuable um, exacerbated inter-village and intra-village conflicts. Uh, but again, uh, unlike uh, Heinrich's examples, none of this led to any violent conflicts. What they would normally be would be um, uh, roadblocks, protests, uh, and uh, locking up timber equipment, that kind of thing. And a lot of the, the reason that this was able to happen uh, in the initial period of decentralization in Indonesia was the lack of village level and super village level uh, institutions uh, with legitimacy and authority to make, validate, and enforce uh, decisions. A lot of the traditional institutions had been uh, significantly weakened during the 32 year uh, Suharto regime. Um, and then within the district government itself, even though they had a lot of power there, there was uh, uh, a lack of, uh, uh, of downward accountability and um, also uh, pretty much a non-functioning uh, judicial system. So uh, which sort of uh, leads me to the situation today where now you have the cowboy logging has stopped but the boom and bust cycle hasn't. And the next boom in Indonesia and in Borneo is gonna be, it looks like, it's related to climate change is red, this reduced emissions from avoided deforestation and degradation. So uh, approximately about 20% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions are due to uh, deforestation and degradation. So the idea is if you keep the forest intact, then you uh, avoid those emissions. And so of course, uh, places like Indonesia are expecting payment 
Um, and I was just there in uh, March, and it's definitely uh, a frenzy. And instead of uh, cowboy logging, it's now uh, carbon cowboys. Um, and uh, there, but there is this promise of compensation. The government's well aware of that. Uh, but land tenure still remains as unclear as ever. And uh, the governance system in places like East Kalimantan remain weak. Uh, and then more broadly, though, you know, just uh, although Indonesia has in, in 10 years uh, transformed dramatically, um, as a lot of us know, the judicial system is still quite weak. So then the, the questions really that I pose to all of you is sort of, you know, how do we engage to sort of help ensure improve locally, lo local livelihoods and well-managed ecosystems? <laughs> And some of the things that, that what we're seeing now are um, policy signals are on the demand side. There's a Lacey Act amendment in the U.S. that makes it illegal uh, to import any sort of timber, wood products that have been harvested illegally. We have the U.S., China, U.S., Indonesia, illegal logging and associated trade MOUs. And you have certain market signals like certification and Walmart and Home Depot making sort of uh, uh, pronouncements about, about that. And then you have uh, certain capacity building projects through bilateral mechanisms like USAID uh, that are working through the supply chain. And that's it. Okay, thank you both for excellent presentations. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we're webcasting this event, so um, if you have a question, please just wait a second for a microphone to come around to you. Um, Who would like to get us? I guess we'll start right in the back there, Sean. Um, thank you for the presentations, they were excellent. I've been working in Indonesia in the Aceh region since the tsunami, and I'm just wondering, um, Henrik, on, for your presentation, um, I didn't quite understand the first, um, the, the, fir the first map that you had, the numbers, I didn't quite understand what they represented, and um, I'm wondering if you've taken, uh, it's just, you know, a, 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 a comment, but if you've taken into account um, the peace process after the tsunami in August uh, 2005, I believe, because in, in the regions in Sumatra that you have uh, blackened, um, you know, in general, all over Sumatra, its violence has really, really decreased since the peace treaty. And I mean, I'm just amazed when I'm there. I mean, it, you know, you feel very safe and people are very happy that they don't have to worry about, you know, curfews and um, burnings, kidnappings. Uh, it might, it might, uh, you know, uh, be uh, something that you might want to take into account because it's remarkable that, you know, it took the tsunami to bring peace to the region. Thanks. I can respond to that. I, I think it's I, I think it's a um, very good comment and and also has some some more general applicability and uh, and looking at how um, we, we actually have a project now looking at at how uh, uh, natural uh, disasters affect um, uh, violence and conflict and it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of that. Of course, Archie is a very very special case. Um, the, just to, 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 to your first question, it, it was a representation of the map, was a representation of, of the number of years uh, where we had observed violence of, of, of the two different kinds. Uh, and there are a lot of other ways of representing this and also studying this, and we also did, did <coughs> sorry, um, uh, try to uh, measure uh, violence in terms of, of um, uh, intensity, the number of people killed. Uh, didn't get very different results, so we, we made it a very simple uh, um, measure for this uh, for this study. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I think obviously the, the the limitations that that we had now was that the data didn't go beyond 2003, so we weren't able to actually look at what what happened in Aceh after uh, or in Indonesia as a whole after the. Uh, um, uh, the catastrophe, but I think that um, uh, we, I'm actually uh, hopefully going to Indonesia uh, in the fall, and and uh, we're looking at different ways of, of following up on this project. And, and Aceh is a very interesting uh, region to to study, so I hope we'll have a chance to to expand that. Uh, right up here. <clears throat> 
Thanks. I, I have a bit of a kind of a long question, so forgive me, but I hope it'll be interesting. And uh, directed to the speakers, thanks very much for your comments, and to anybody else who has an idea about this. Um, and I'll begin by saying, making a couple comments, and um, I, I, if this is if these are arguable topics, please let me know. It seems to me that it's in general it's very difficult to quantify the relationships between environmental decline and conflict. And although everybody's been trying to do it, it's really hard to put our finger on direct relationships and, and be predictive in any kind of a way. And it, it also seems to me that it, uh, just as it's been important to, um, to, to make explicit the linkages between climate change or between greenhouse gases and climate change and now between climate change and security, uh, as a way of m mobilizing resources for working to uh, reverse those those trends, it seems to me it's also very important to be able to make the linkages between environmental declines in general and security issues as a way of mobilizing huge U.S. government force, uh, 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 resources and other resources to combat those things. <clears throat> so one idea that we've been having, and I come from Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, one idea that we've been having is to gather together experts like the folks in this room and the speakers and um, folks from the Wilson Center. We've got a collaboration that we're working on with, this, with uh, Eric Peterson at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, people in the War College, Marcella Ramirez, Jeff, if you're still listening, your name has come up, the Wilson Center has come up. And we'd like to bring together a collaboration of experts in this field and work with them to come up with a few case studies, two or three or four places in the world where we think we could nail these relationships in a quantifiable, rigorous way and then use all the expertise from all these people that we'd like to bring together to build a system dynamics computer simulation model of these dynamics, of these uh, environmental and security dynamics and and then use the the modeling and the whole process the whole collaborative process to make explicit these linkages and demonstrate these linkages in in something of a rigorous way so as to be able to show the cynics or the critics that you know we really do believe that there are these linkages and they can be quantified and that by taking certain kinds of measures you can reverse the trends. And so I'm curious to know from anybody who has an opinion on this, does, does that seem like a reasonable approach? Do you think we could come up with two or three case studies around the world that would be where, in which we would be successful at building those kinds of models, collecting the data, understanding the relationships, building the models? Um, do, does that seem like a worthwhile approach? Does it seem like we could be successful in doing something like that? So that's the question that I have for our speakers and anybody else. You guys like to take a shot at that? Um, I, I guess I, I was just in, in listening um, to your comment and question, which is a really fascinating one. I just kept thinking about um, the closest that experience that I've had to anything like that was uh, with the Resilience Alliance and uh, trying to use complexity theory to uh, model what was going on in the forests of uh, Malinao. And I think from a research perspective, to me that made a lot of sense from an applied sort of policy perspective, to me that didn't make a lot of sense because of the costs uh, required to carry out that kind of uh, experiment, uh, especially in a place like, like the region of, of Borneo that I work in where the drivers are so evident. Um, so, so I guess that would be really my only comment, and the only sort of connection I've had with that is the is the resilience lines, which I think is still going strong, which may be related to the uh, Santa Fe Institute as well, if I'm not mistaken. If I can just respond very quickly, I I think it's I think it's a very good idea, and I think it's I think it certainly uh, is feasible. I my my general uh, problem is that I. Obviously, there is there is a huge challenge with, with regards to data uh, in, in in many of the areas that are most susceptible to violence related to environmental factors. Um, long data series aren't aren't available, uh, and so, so that's that's obviously a major challenge. It, it shouldn't shouldn't stop you though. Uh, I think it's a it's it's interesting uh, idea to think of, and, and I'm sure that some people. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to point you in the direction of, of, of data that could be useful for, for such a project. I think at the same time, I, since, since you bring in uh, climate change, I think it's important to just acknowledge the, 
so the, the, at least what what where the field today is that and, and relationship between climate change and security is that while there is a, a, a good case for a relationship between climate change and, and uh, human security issues, the, still the the case of a, of a of a very clear link between climate change and sort of more conventional security issues is still um, a, a little bit. Um, I, I think we still. Um, we're still quite far away from from saying that that climate change will be a, a, a very important sort of conventional security issue, uh, and and that many of the claims that are out there have not been sort of regular, subject to rigorous testing, and that we should be at least careful about ad, sort of advancing um, sort of general claims that 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 haven't been uh, sort of substantiated. Uh, that's my concern, but but I. I uh, I readily accept that there are issues here that are very worthy of, of, of further study. Um, up here, Dan. Yeah, I'm Dan Martin from Conservation International. Um, I uh, have a question, well, uh, the comment first, and that is that I recall um, a line of uh, Aristotle, who said that the mark, something like this, the mark of a civilized person, well, he said man, uh, <laughs> um, is to seek precision in all things to the extent that the matter allows. And it does strike me that uh, seeking um, a computer-generated uh, prediction outcome based on data which are very difficult to disaggregate. And I've wrestled with this myself in it, that disaggregation is just a huge problem because nation states in many cases are quite irrelevant uh, structures to these issues. Um, and uh, because they're so internally differentiated. And Indonesia, well, both Indonesia and India, but uh, your map showed Java being almost solid black with the uh, the recurring uh, violence. And I wondered if you took um, population density as a variable. I mean, when you have such a very high density in Java compared to most of the rest of Indonesia, um, and there are certainly places in Africa and elsewhere where that uh, there's a high correlation. Um, uh, did you leave it out, and if so, why? Not the rate, but the yeah. level. No, definitely, uh, we, uh, we, we do. Uh, I, I've, I've looked at different measures of density, and, and the, the measure that uh, we've been using in this study is uh, a measure that takes into account the uh, availability of arable land. And there are a couple of, of, uh, of I mean, if, if you, even if you exclude the, so the, the more sort of city regions like, uh, like Jakarta, for instance, uh, and Banten, um, there is no relationship between density and, uh, and uh, violence. Uh, this is actually quite. Uh, Except that Java was all black. Yeah, but but statistically there is still still no. I mean, generally, if if even okay, so so the the, the especially the, the episodic violence is 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 primarily happening in the low density areas uh, in Indonesia. Uh, but but even when you look at in a multivariate model, uh, when you look at the effect of density, uh, we also have a measure for uh, the, the the percentage of population that's living in urban areas. That measure uh, is statistically significant associated with the, 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 the data that you saw on the map, the, the um, um, what we call the, uh, it escapes me right now, um, so the, the more everyday types of, of violence. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is violence that primarily is happening in urban centers. Uh, so, so it's not a surprise that that it, uh, there is a relationship both between sort of population size, so there is a higher per capita uh, uh, level of, of, of violence, if you like. Uh, but densities as such, or, or the availability of, of land, uh, is not associated uh, statistically with either form of, uh, of violence. Even though you have that, there are those high scores for Java yes. over many years. Yes. Countryside. Oh, right. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that you can 
drive a long distance in Java and feel as if you've never really left mm -hmm. at least suburbia, mm -hmm. even though it's a rural landscape and uh, the number of people there are extremely dense. So I don't quite understand how you reach the score that says there's little um, uh, scarcity of land in Java. No, it's it's not it's not little dense. It's not little uh, scarcity of land in Java, but there doesn't seem to be land scarcity that's driving the relationships that we find. Uh, no, just right next door. Go ahead. Well, do you want to comment on this? I'm Aline Gelbard with the Public Health Institute, and I found your presentations very interesting. I'm a demographer by training, working on health now, and I have a comment in response to your question. Maybe I'll just try to answer that really quickly, uh, because as I listened to you, all I could think of were more questions about how to refine the measurements and the difficulties in doing that, especially when you get down to the community level. So I don't know if you could come up with a computer simulation or even find four places in the world um, where you could put in, you'd have enough data to account for all of the variables that are affecting the relationships that we're looking at. Uh, so that would, I, but having said that, maybe another way to go about it is to just gather a lot of examples and maybe someone's doing this and try to look at the similarities of uh, combinations of variables and build up to something rather than trying to just find four places and take everything into account. But I had two comments. Um, one, uh, uh, Steve, I'd very much like to talk to you about uh, later, but I'll just mention the project that I'm running in Indonesia right now, which is bringing companies and NGOs together to build partnerships on health. And basically what, what it is, C4 is a member, and we have now 51 organizations participating. And the whole idea is to build enough trust and give them an opportunity to exchange information and views these meetings. We have meetings quarterly that are off the record to, um, to, to, to build relationships that can address exactly the kind of, of challenge that you're talking about. So I'd be happy to give you or anyone else more details yeah, about the process. Yeah, I think that it's, it's very applicable to just about any development challenge. We happen to be looking at health, but it's the process that we it, at Ford Foundation is funding it it was an experiment, and we found that there is a lot of receptivity to the idea of partnerships. There's also a lot of mistrust and obstacles, and so we're trying to help them overcome that through this process. Uh, then the other thing, um, Henrik, I, I wondered when you looked at, you said migration wasn't a factor in what you found, but uh, I lived in Indonesia 10 years ago, and I remember at that time uh, the DIACs especially came up because there was a lot of tension in a lot of places that resulted from migration policies uh, imposed by the, um, the Indonesian government. And one source of tension appeared to be that they would bring migrants in from Java, give them a lot of resources so that they were actually arriving better off than the people in the areas where they were moving to. And that was a natural formula for for tension, so I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. No, that, <clears throat> that's that's exactly why uh, uh, why we decided to uh, to not um, use the migration data that we had because it was uh, it was only um, so it, it was a uh, macro measure of in and out migration between the different regions, and we know that I mean it's 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 uh, uh, very much the case as you say that that it's it's really. Um, so the specificities of, of this migration that, that we should expect to have an impact on violence levels and particularly um, having data on, uh, on sort of being able to break it down on, on ethnicity uh, would, would be extremely useful. I think it, it uh, I hope that we will be able to, uh, to get that kind of data. It's not available in the public domain as far as I know, uh, but I, I suspect that um, we should be able to find something there if we could get that kind of data because I, I, I very much I mean, it, that that's really the story about migration and, and violence that goes in, in Indonesia and I would be very surprised if we don't find anything there. Um, and the two questions back there. <laughs> 
I'm Beatrice Domri from Population Action International, and I have a comment on the, the research project uh, outlined by the gentleman there. Uh, I'm working on the Haiti case, uh, case studies, trying to uh, see the linkage between uh, environmental issues and uh, security and political instability. I think that my w one challenge that you might encounter is the, um, the sense of the causal relationship, because in the Haiti case, for instance, political instability has been a, a very big obstacle to reforestation pro, uh, projects. And so it's not only that climate issues influence security, but it might be the other way around. So that's, that's just one common head. And I also have a question to Hendrik. I'm not sure I understood it rightly, but in your India project, I think that you measure uh, population pressure by rural population growth, is that exact? And I was wondering why, because urban population growth put also a lot of pressure or resource scarcity uh, in terms of uh, approvisionment to the, to the city, food and so on. Mm. Hi, Beatrice. Higlio says. I may have done this a little too, uh, too quickly, but we are actually looking at, at rural both rural and urban population growth uh, as, as different measures. But um, since, since in the literature it's seen as sort of a, a primary and a secondary sort of source of violence, uh, I just present that a little bit um, sort of, um, rapidly, perhaps. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting to see that urban growth rates, both in the India case and in, in, in all other cases that I've looked at it, uh, does not have any impact on levels of political violence. So, so the areas that, are, and that, that could be, it, 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 it could be sort of a, a case of reversal causality as well. <clears throat> Sorry, because in the areas that are relatively stable, so in the urban areas that are relatively stable that provide opportunities for people uh, in terms of jobs, education, etc., cetera, uh, would attract a lot of people. So the most violent places may not attract a lot of people uh, because uh, they don't really provide opportunities, provide sort of insecurity instead. So there might also be a sort of reversal uh, causality there. But, but generally, there is no relationship. And, and, and we've done a city-level study now as well, looking at are cities that have high growth rates uh, you know, more susceptible to violence than, than cities with low growth rates? And there just is no relationship sort of system systematically. And then there was one just right up there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ivan Valencia. I'm at the University of Maryland. I'm doing a paper a policy proposal for WWF on linking transboundary haze pollution, red, and forest fire management in Indonesia. So the question is for Steve. Um, how do you envisage uh, when if red comes to happen officially or even, even now in the preliminary projects, how can the distribution of benefits be given to to the Dayak, to to the actual people preserving the forest on the ground, given the uncertainty of land tenure, and how does the Indonesian government think it will do that? Uh, and yeah, those, those are exactly my questions. <laughs> if you, what have you heard from them in, on that front? And the second question, just very uh, pointedly, uh, who is if if the district governments are not issuing the license anymore, is this, is that back to the central government? And so, if so, how is it working? So just on the second question, in 2002, uh, district governments uh, all over uh, places like Kalimantan quit issuing permits, and that's primarily because of uh, the central government uh, started re-centralizing. And they could do that because a lot of the district budgets, for example, in Malinao, the district operating budget was still coming from the central government. Uh, so they couldn't generate their own revenue to operate the local government, so the central government had uh, had them on a short leash in that sense. Um, and so, and that was ge generally the case throughout Indonesia. So after about 2002, you see a real drop in the number of these uh, short-term concessions. And um, it's essentially the, the central government, you know, sort of uh, clawing back a little bit of its power. Um, as far as your first question goes, you know, I was there in March, and th those are precisely the questions that I have, you know, and I don't know how uh, uh, in places like East Kalimantan, um, not only between uh, sort of villagers and uh, 
and and say the government of Indonesia, but between the central government, the provincial government, and the district governments, because those relationships and the sort of uh, accountability factors there, and you know the how how the how the revenue and benefits will will accrue, uh, and how they'll be distributed is entirely unclear. Uh, but I think the the gen the idea. So there was recently a letter by I can't remember the, which UN commission it was, but it was to the government of Indonesia commenting on uh, that they couldn't endorse uh, red uh, projects in in Indonesia unless uh, land tenure and uh, indigenous uh, issues were settled first. So everybody's very aware of that, and I think everybody you know involved in the sort of climate change discussion, it's, it's probably, well, the UNFF is going on right now in New York, the United Nations uh, Forest f Forum, and that's one of the key issues. And did you want to make your <coughs> comment about that earlier? Or? I'm Helen Rafael, Resources for the Future, but uh, the comment I wanted to make was that uh, when I worked in, in um, Ujung Pandang, it was called Makassar at the time, I think it's Makassar again on Sulawesi. Uh, that also was very black on the map contempor contemporarily, and it was uh, very violent at the time that I worked there, uh, even though it was the 1950s, and uh, it was not densely populated, unlike Jawa. Uh, but uh, the, there were two sources of violence. One was the Darul Islam, the, uh, even though it became <laughs> sort of from the 1920s in opposition to the Dutch, who, who were the colonists at the time, uh, they became Islamic. It was a very thin Islamic, but there was the um, the hardcore Islamists who came down from the mountains and were raiding, and in fact, uh, had uh, kidnapped the whole ground crew of the airport uh, at the time that we were all going to go back to my family and I were going to go back to the states. We had to take a ship, so that was one source of violence. The uh, the hardcore Islamists, and I don't know quite what made them so. Hardcore. I don't know today even what makes a difference between the uh, very lightly Islamic ones that I've worked with in Morocco and uh, and Uzbekistan as opposed to the uh, heavier ones now. But it seems to me that religion is a very important source, as you discovered in India. And also the second source of violence was the hatred of immigrants from China, the overseas Chinese who in fact were not the indigenous agriculturalists, but were the, we said the Jews of the Orient, where they came in and were the, the money uh, people and the shopkeepers and so forth. So that uh, immigration, uh, that is to say migration, makes a difference whenever a foreign element comes in and there's resentment for the types of, um, of knowledge and uh, economic activities that they practice. So uh, I, I was going to say that uh, it wasn't population density at the time, it was different lifestyles that made for the great conflict. Now if you want to look for the sources of why people strictly adhere to one lifestyle and uh, are in opposition to other types of lifestyle, that would be something else again. Okay, thank you. And uh, down here. Yeah, Chia Chen, freelance correspondent. Henry, in your uh, uh, Indian study, uh, you have uh, uh, land res uh, resources, but uh, you don't have a ho a water in there. Mm -hmm. And also the population. Uh, in the Indian, you said that uh, uh, urban population no effect, and you just uh, explained that because uh, uh, stability. Uh, but uh, in uh, Indonesia, you say it's uh, population have weak effect. Uh, in the Indo Indonesia case, you talk it, it as a whole, or you uh, you are not separate. Uh, uh, rural and uh, urban. And uh, to the Steve, uh, 
uh, what is uh, REDD? Yeah, REDD, you have said there is reduced emission from avoid uh, uh, deforestation and degradation. And who is handle this uh, REDD? Thank you. <clears throat> um, it's it's correct. We we don't separate between rural and urban population growth in uh, in Indonesia, uh, uh, and and we didn't have uh, su for some reason uh, I, I believe we didn't have sufficiently good uh, rural population growth uh, sorry urban population growth data uh, to to separate uh, between uh, between rural and urban population growth. Um, but I, uh, that's also one of the follow-up projects of this. Uh, that should it, that kind of data should be available, but uh, but has not been uh, published, with, sort of with official uh, Indonesian statistic uh, statistic publications, uh, I believe. But again, that that data should be available, and also more specific uh, uh, migration data. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's certainly a thing we will we'll be looking into. Uh, yeah, water. We, no, I, I haven't looked at water uh, in any of these models. We have, uh, in, I mentioned briefly, we have a, um, a, a, that um, I published a paper um, in 2006 uh, in political geography, uh, and there's a short version of that uh, in uh, the latest ECSP report where we look globally at um, uh, subnational level, dividing up the world into small GIS cells. Um, of 100 times 100 uh, kilometers. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that we want to sort of bypass the national level, which I agree uh, with the previous commentator is, is, has some sort of disadvantages. Um, and we wanted to look at, uh, at sort of what, what if, if we look at sort of equally sized squares in the world and look at local relationships. And there we we have water as, as one of the factors using sort of uh, 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 geocoded data on water availability, and we actually do find the relationship between water scarcity uh, and and conflict, uh, and especially water scarcity uh, interacting with population pressure. Although it's a relatively weak effect, there is still still an effect of that. I haven't done that for India, but uh, it, it could be done both for India and Indonesia as well. Uh, just quickly on REDD, the, the reduced emissions from avoided deforestation and degradation. Uh, that was formalized uh, in the 2007 um, UNFCCC in Bali, the climate change discussions there. And the concept is basically compensating countries that have a lot of standing forest um, for not cutting down those forests. So essentially, be as far as the climate change discussions go, uh, during the, for the Kyoto Protocol, forests weren't part of that negotiation. They weren't included, so they became included in Bali. And so uh, countries like Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, uh, Brazil to a less extent, in a different f uh, fashion, really sort of pushed this idea that uh, developing countries with, uh, with, with uh, valuable intact forest should be compensated for avoiding those emissions. Um, and part of that is, if you think about Indonesia and the statistic I had about, you know, the in 2001, $4 billion in wood-based uh, exports. You know, I mean, most of those exports are, are coming here in Europe. And so it was this idea that, you know, you the, 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 the consumers, our consumption would impart, you know, Sort of take responsibility for for some of the emissions, and um, just the it's being it's being nego negotiated now. So right now it's voluntary. There's nothing compulsory about it, but uh, there's a lot of attention focused on it. So if you go to Indonesia, you have a lot of different NGOs and uh, companies. Like actually in Malinau, I can there's a website up by this group called uh, Eco Rescue, and they've uh, carved out a carbon deal uh, with the gov district government and one of the uh, state-owned timber companies. And they're essentially trying to lock up that, that area in hopes of being able to sell carbon credits, so offsets. So let's see, a company here can emit more if they purchase the carbon credits in, in Indonesia. And so then that force won't be cut down. Okay, I think we've uh, exhausted the questions. And um, I want to thank everybody for the great questions, great conversation. And I want to thank our presenters for uh, bringing these really complex issues uh, to light.
And um, please join me in uh, thanking our presenters.